Chapter 2 Beauty Sirens of the Jinn Quotes In the distant future, I see open fields for far more important resources. Psychology will be based on new foundation. Charles Darwin on the origin of his species. Another quote Good Lord Boyet, my beauty, though but mean, needs not the painted flourish of your praise. Beauty is bought by judgment of the eye, not uttered by base sale of Chapman's tongues. Shakespeare loves lovers lost. In 1757, David Hume argued in his book, Standard of Taste, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty, he said, is no quality in things themselves. It exists merely in the mind which contemplates them, and each mind perceives a different beauty. Close quotes. This naturally raises a question, why is this standard of beauty in the eye of that beholder? A century after Hume, Darwin laid the foundation, evolution by natural selection, for a psychology that explains why. Beauty is a perception of fitness payoffs on offer, such as the payoffs for eating that apple or dating that person. This perception will differ from species to species, person to person, and even time to time, as niches and niches differ. Reproductive success depends on collecting fitness points. Beauty tells us what and where they are. Evolutionary psychology makes new and surprising predictions about our judgments of human beauty. Each time, for instance, that you glance at a face, you scrutinize its eyes, scoring them on a checklist of details, and arrive through unconscious deliberation at a verdict on their beauty. What women find attractive about the eyes of a man sometimes differs from what men find attractive about the eyes of a woman. Our ancestors relied on this unwritten checklist for millennia, but the new science of beauty has revealed some of its items. We discuss these items and the logic of their discovery as well as some practical applications. The predictions of evolution about beauty are surprising, but as we will see in chapter 9, its predictions about physical objects are disconcerting. Objects like beauty are in the eye of the beholder and inform us about fitness, not about objective reality. To prepare us for the perplexing case of objects, let's warm up our intuitions by exploring the perception of beauty in the animal kingdom. Male jewel beetles, Zulodimorpha bakewelli have a thing for beautiful females. The males fly about searching for females which are shiny, dimpled and brown. Recently, some male primates of the Homo sapiens species have been driving through the beetles' horns in Western Australia and littering the outback with emptied beer bottles, known as stubbies. Undercourts. As it happened, some of the stubbies were shiny, dimpled and just the right shade of brown to catch the fancy of the male beetles. Forsaking real females, the male beetles swooned over the stubbies with their genitalia averted and doggedly tried to mate despite glassy rebuffs. A classic case of the male leaving the female for the bottle. Adding injury to insult, ants of the species Iridomyrmax discourse learn to loiter near stubbies, wait for the befuddled and priapistic beetles, and then devour them, genitalia first, as they fail to have their way. The poor beetles teetered on extinction, and Australia had to change its beer bottles to save its beetles. This blunder of the beetle is surprising. Male beetles have mated with females for untold thousands of years. You would think they surely know their females. Apparently not. Even when a male crawls over his stubby, enjoying not embodied contact, he perceives it as a siren, a 370 milliliter Amazon of irresistible allure. Something is awry. Why should a beetle fall for a bottle? Is it due, perhaps, to his tiny brain? Perhaps mammals with their bigger brains would never make such a silly mistake, but they do. Moose in Alaska, Montana and elsewhere have been found and photographed mating with metal statues of moose, and even bison, sometimes for hours and end. We can laugh, but Homo sapiens has its own checkered history, including sex dolls that starred centuries ago in Mughal paintings of India and robots that start today in the International Congress of Love and Sex with Robots. Our bigger brains guarantee no inherent in attraction to bona fide human beauties. What then is beauty? Surprisingly, given the panoply of foibles besetting beetles, Moose, Homo sapiens, and many other species, beauty is the intelligent verdict of a complex but mostly unconscious computation. Each time you encounter a person, 
your senses automatically inspect dozens, perhaps hundreds of telltale clues, all in a fraction of a second. These clues, meticulously selected through eons of evolution, inform you about one thing, reproductive potential. That is, could this person have and raise healthy offspring? Of course, explicit thoughts about this question and explicit clues to a verdict are not what you typically experience in that encounter. Instead, you experience just the verdict itself as a feeling that varies from heart to not. That feeling, that executive summary of a painstaking investigation is the beauty in the eye of the beholder, which gives the lie to the idea that beauty is a whim of the beholder. To the contrary, it is the consequence of unconscious inferences within the beholder, inferences that were crafted over millennia by the logic of natural selection. If the inferences too often delivered a verdict of hot when they should have said not, or vice versa, then the beholder would too often prefer mates who were less likely to raise healthy offspring. In this case, the beholder's misguiding genes and their faulty inferences would be less likely to pass into the next generation. In short, if genes get beauty wrong, they tend to go extinct. This is the pitiless logic of natural selection. It's all about struggles between genes, which is to say, it's all about fitness, the central concept of evolution by natural selection. Genes that are more adept at elbowing their way into the next generation are said to be fitter. Even a slight excess of talent in the art of the elbow can allow a gene to proliferate across generations and eradicate competitors of but moderate talent. Oscar Wilde understood this logic well. Moderation, he wrote, is a fatal thing. Nothing succeeds like excess. Genes don't elbow each other directly. They do it by proxy. They boot up bodies and minds, phenotypes, and let them duke it out. Phenotypes that fare better at the brawl are like their respective genotypes, said to be fitter. The fitness of a phenotype depends, of course, not just on genes, but also on the vagaries of disease, development, nutrition, and the common depredations of time. Identical twins, for instance, can differ in their phenotypic fitness. But make no mistake, even though genes battle by proxy, they have a skin in the game. Like pilots in a plane, genes sit strapped into their phenotype. If it crashes, they die. The computation of beauty is part of the battle by proxy, one of the ingenious devices deployed by genes to compete with other genes to enhance fitness. Your computation of beauty, in a recursive twist, can enhance your own fitness if you compute beauty better than your competition does. Fitness, enhancing it, estimating it, and enhancing it by estimating it, is the preoccupation of evolution by natural selection. The computation of beauty is wired into us early in life, Infants as young as two months of age look longer at faces that adults rate more attractive. The trouble with computing beauty, with ferreting out the fitness of genes, is that genes themselves are invisible. This forces genes to hunt for evidence of fitness in the only place where it can be seen, in phenotypes, in the bodies and minds that other genes have fashioned and pressed into their service. But a phenotype rarely wears its fitness on its sleeve. It must be scoured for clues. Sherlock Holmes claimed that the success of a detective depends on the observation of trifles, under quotes. One trifle in the search for beauty is a feature of the human eye called limbal ring, a dark annulus at the border between the colored iris and the white sclera. I first noticed this ring in the Afghan girl, a photograph of Sharbat Gula that graced the June 1985 cover of National Geographic and became the most recognized photograph in the magazine's history. I wondered whether her prominent uh, limbal rings, which transform her eyes into veritable bull's eyes, might rivet our attention and enhance her beauty. Why might prominent limbal rings be attractive? Or to ask this in the language of evolution, why might such rings uh, signal greater fitness? As it happens, prominent rings signal health. For limbal rings to be prominent, they must be visible. And for that, the cornea, the transparent outer layer of the eye, must be clear and healthy. Diseases such as glaucoma and corneal edema can cloud the cornea, making limbal rings less visible. Poor lipid metabolism can trigger arcus senilis, milky deposits of cholesterol that hide the rings. Dysregulation of calcium in the blood can cause limbus sign, milky deposits of calcium that again hide the rings. A medley of diseases can obscure the limbal rings. Someone with distinct rings is less likely to suffer them. 
Prominent rings also signal fitness by signaling youth. Measurements by Darren Peshak, then a graduate student in my lab, assisted by a team of undergraduates, found that the thickness of limbal rings, and hence their prominence, declines with age. In principle, then, limbal rings signal youth, health, and thus fitness. But has evolution in fact turned our heart or not meter, the computation of beauty within the Homo sapiens beholder, to spot the subtle clues to fitness in limbal rings? To find out, Peshek showed observers on each trial of an experiment a pair of faces that were identical, except that one had limbal rings and one did not. Observers had to pick the face that looked more attractive. The data were clear. Male and female observers prefer male and female faces with limbal rings, even if the faces are shown upside down. Then, through a sequence of experiments, Peshek discovered the ideal rings, those whose thickness, opacity, and tapering look most attractive. Knowing this ideal, you can enhance your portrait by editing your rings or kick up your eyes with contacts now available that mimic hot rings like makeup applied directly to the eye itself. This highlights a hazard for beholders of beauty. Genes can lie about fitness. They can rig their phenotype, planting mendacious clues in its body and deceptions on its mind. By lying about the fitness that they offer a beholder, genes can amass more fitness for themselves. Sometimes the lie is white, lipstick and eyeliner have never hurt a soul. Sometimes the lie is cynical and exploitative. Hammer orchids of genus Drakea in Western Australia peddle sex to tiny wasps. The female wasp, when in the mood, climbs a blade of grass and rubs her legs to broadcast a scent appealing to males. A charmed male tracks her scent and flies a snaking pattern upwind until he finds her. He embraces her whisks her up to the meter high club, then down to his pre-arranged pad, which caters a gourmet banquet of beetle larvae. There she lays her eggs and dies. The average flower next door has no chance to seduce a male thynid, but the genes of the hammer orchid have given it a celebrity makeover, a green and slender stem with the ambience of grass, dangling from its top a labellum with the shapely curves, alluring color, velvety texture, and enticing scent of a female thynid. An entranced male tries to whisk off with the labellum, but learns that this would-be mate will not cooperate. He eventually flies off in frustration, bearing pollen daubed on him surreptitiously during his deflating ordeal. When he tries his luck with another fake mate, he pollinates it. In this charade, Drakea genes get fitness. The wasp just gets used. The lies of genes in the quest for fitness can cross the border from cynical to sinister. Female fireflies of the genus Photoris lure male fireflies of the genus Photinus with a tragic ending. On a lonely night, a Photinus male emits a sequence of flashes. A receptive Photinus female can answer with a sequence of flashes that dovetail with his to form a choreographed duet. Upon receiving her reply, the hopeful male flies to her and mates. The Photoris female has broken the code of Photinus and responds to a Photinus male's flashes with the proper duet. When the Photinus male arrives for his tryst, he finds a female much larger than he expected and gets eaten. The callous genes of Photinus promise Photinus the ultimate in fitness rewards, but deliver instead the ultimate in fitness penalties. This sinister bait and switch enhances the fitness of Photoris in an obvious way, vital calories, but with a less conspicuous twist. Photinus fireflies contain Lucy Bufagins, LBZs, steroids toxic to many potential predators. When bitten or squeezed, a Photinus firefly exudes a drop of blood laden with LBZs that, to a would-be predator, tastes foul, meaning bad for my fitness, prompting it to release the firefly. The Photuris firefly, by eating a Photinus laden with LBZs, inoculates itself against predators. Beauty is our best estimate of reproductive potential. But as the sagas of Photirus and Drakea and countless others reveal, the genes behind the scenes of the beauty game are ruthless operators, unfettered by moral compunction, unhesitant to deceive and destroy in their single-minded quest to enhance their own fitness, to amass fitness points. They play for keeps in zero-sum games. Photirus devours Photinus and racks up fitness points by siphoning all of his calories and LVGs. Photinus loses everything. Drakea deceives the thynid and racks up fitness points in the form of pollination. The thynid loses fitness points in the form of time and calories wasted on Drakea. 
Fitness points are the coin of the realm. The more one collects, the greater one's chance to succeed in reproduction. Machiavellian genes nab fitness points, not as honest wages, but as filthy lucre. Fitness points are not carved in stone, but are as varied as the organisms that seek them and as fickle as the desires that signal them. For a fortinous male looking to mate, an eligible fortinous female offers a fitness bonanza. For an amorous male of homo sapiens, she offers nothing. A change of organism with all else fixed can radically change the fitness payoffs. The payoffs to an organism vary with its state. A clear example is hunger. The delight of a famished teen at the smell of a pizza signals the bounty of fitness offered by the first slice. The indifference or even disgust of that teen an hour and six slices later to that same smell signals a dearth of fitness. Same teen, same pizza, but a big change in the fitness and offer because the state and needs of the teen have changed. Fitness points depend on the organism, its state and its action. Your feeling of sexual attraction from heart to not signals your sophisticated estimate of reproductive potential. This estimate we have seen. Here's the state of the limbal ring. What other features of the eye, I wondered, might it attend? Flipping through photos of faces, I noticed that the colored iris looked larger in the eyes of infants than of adults. Negar Samagnezad, a former graduate student in my lab, assisted by undergraduates, confirmed and refined my informal observation with careful measurements on a database of photographs from birth to age 50. There is a decline in the area of the iris relative to the white sclera. But from age 50 on, this area of the iris increases as tissues around the eyes sag and cover the sclera. So the area of the iris relative to the sclera varies systematically with age. This data led me to predict that men prefer, in women under 50, irises that are slightly larger. The facts underwriting this prediction are simple. Larger irises and fertility correlate with youth in females under 50. The infertility rate for females aged 20 is about 3%, aged 30 about 8%, aged 40 about 32%, aged 50 100%. The likelihood of success in getting pregnant for females aged 20 is about 86%. At age 30, it is about 63%. At age 40, it is about 36%. And at age 50, it is about zero. This decline in female fertility has shaped, through natural selection, male judgments of female beauty. The logic is simple. Consider a man whose genes happens to code for a computation of beauty that prizes women over, say, age 50. He can enjoy life in the company of these beauties, but what is the chance that they will bear children with his genes and his computation of beauty? Almost none. By contrast, what is this chance for a man whose genes prize woman age 20? Nearly certain. There is, however, a twist. A woman's fertility is not the same as her reproductive value, the number of offspring she can expect in the future. Genes that prize reproductive value tend to win, to elbow their way into the next generation. This value peaks at age 20. A woman at age 25 may be more fertile than she was at 20, but her reproductive value was greater at 20. So we expect that natural selection has shaped men to find women most beautiful at about 20. This leads to a clean prediction. Men over 20 should prefer younger women. Men under 20 should prefer older women. Both predictions have been confirmed in experiments. Men over 20 prefer younger women. No surprise, but Teen males prefer women who are slightly older. This supports an evolutionary account of our certain rival accounts. The preference of teen males is not, for instance, due to positive reinforcement from older women who rarely reciprocate teen advances. It is not a desire to dominate, which is unlikely to succeed with older women, nor is it due to culture. The experiments have been replicated in, in several cultures. In some natural selection fashion within men, a feeling for beauty that pivots on evidence of reproductive value. Any signal of youth, such as a larger iris, is crucial evidence of reproductive value in a woman. So I predicted in 2010 that men prefer larger irises in women under 50. This prediction is distinct from the prediction about the attractiveness of limbal rings. The size of an iris can vary without varying the size or visibility of its limbal rings. To test this prediction, Samak Nezar showed observers pairs of faces that were identical, except that the irises of one face were larger. Observers picked the more attractive face. The data were clear. Men prefer female faces with larger irises, even if the faces are seen upside down. 
Our genes compel men to detect and desire this subtle cue to female fitness. A woman who knows this can enhance her beauty. In photographs, she can simply edit her irises. In daily life, she can wear big eyes, contacts that enlarge irises. These contacts are now popular in Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. An artist who understands the impact of iris size can manipulate her viewers. Indeed, art, in this case, anticipates science. Japanese anime and manga cartoons seeking to accentuate youth depicted female characters with large irises long before our research. What about women? Do they prefer large irises in men? Recall that a limbal ring signals youth and health by being distinct and that women evolved to prefer men with distinct rings. But a large iris only signals youth, unlike a distinct ring which bespeaks an eye that is clear and thus free of disease, a large iris offers little clue to health other than the clue of youth. So in the case of irises, unlike the case of limbal rings, it is more difficult to predict what women want. Their tastes are more complex. This complexity of preference is for a good evolutionary reason, parental investment. Raising offsprings demands some investment of time and energy from each parent, but the amount of investment can differ between the two parents. In mammals, the female must invest heavily in gestation and nursing. The male, however, may invest heavily providing food and protection or minimally by simply mating and living. The greater your investment, the fussier your choice of mate. If each mating is costly, then you will choose judiciously. Genes that code for rash choices are less likely to survive into the next generation. If, however, your investment is small, then another strategy is available. Be less picky and have multiple mates. Genes that adopt this strategy of quantity over quality can still perpetuate themselves across generations, even if each offspring has less chance to survive. The sex with greater investment is pickier in choosing mates. The one with less investment is less choosy and competes for access to pickier sex, in some cases with physical battles and in other cases such as the peacock with impressive displays. This explains why typically men court and women choose. However, the investments and thus these roles are reversed in some species. For certain seahorses, the males are the keepers of the bag of eggs. In this case, the females court and the males choose. In species where the sexes have equal investment, both are finicky. The crested auklet, for instance, is a seabird dwelling in the northern Pacific and Bering Sea. A mating pair has a single offspring which both parents equally incubate as an egg and raise as a chick. Both sexes support colorful plumage and a forehead crest, exude a strong citrus scent, and boast a complex trumpet call. Human biology dictates that each woman must invest heavily in each child, but it gives each man a choice. Some men invest little, but many choose to invest heavily to provide food and protection for their mate and children. In no other species of primates do males regularly provide food, females fend for themselves. A woman who mates with a man of resources and commitment will more likely succeed in raising kids. So selection shaped women to prefer men with resources and with status, which correlates with resources. This preference crosses cultures and intensifies in women who have more resources. It is no side effect of financial inequality. A man's age and height correlate with his status and resources. Women across cultures prefer tall and slightly older men. A woman can tell from a photo of a face if a man is prone to cheat and divert resources to other women. Cheaters tend to look more masculine, but not more attractive. Men are less able to discern female cheaters. Indeed, as moose and beetles demonstrate, males with little investment sometimes fail to discern females from bottles or statues. A woman who mates with a man of good genes will more likely succeed in raising healthy kids. Such genes correlate with levels of testosterone. Because testosterone promotes the growth of bone and muscle, men with more testosterone during puberty develop more masculine faces with longer and squarer jaws and larger eyebrow ridges. So, selection shaped women to prefer men with more masculine faces. But there is a wrinkle. Higher testosterone is correlated with less investment in offspring and a greater tendency to cheat. A woman faces a fitness trade-off, mate with a man of lower testosterone but higher commitment or made with a man of higher testosterone but lower commitment. Trade-offs like these are common in evolution, and genes that play the trade-off better will more often get the nod to the next generation. 
in the case of women the genes are geniuses and strive to reap the fitness benefits of both choices they incline women to prefer masculine faces more strongly in the high fertility phase of the menstrual cycle they choreograph hormones and brain activity to shift a woman's desires for male faces throughout the monthly cycle increasing the chance that her kids will have good genes and a committed man but genes don't stop at masculine faces they choreograph a woman's preference for masculine gets bodies odors voices and personalities women in the low fertility phase feel more commitment to their partner but during the high fertility phase they are more prone to cheat due to fantasize about cheating to dress attractively and to meet and flirt with new men if however a woman's partner is attractive or if his mhc genes which code for the immune system complement hers and incline their children toward immune health then her wandering eye is less pronounced again a clever strategy by genes to play the odds for a greater fitness payoff for the most part these machinations of genes fly under the radar of conscious experience and foster but do not force a choice of action given these unconscious intrigues of unscrupulous genes it is tricky to predict what a woman might want in the iris of a man a smaller iris suggests greater age and thus greater resources a larger iris suggests youth and thus healthier genes Perhaps a woman prefers a smaller iris, a smaller iris when her fertility is low and a larger iris when it is high. Samaknazar's experiments did not measure fertility and found no preference for iris size, perhaps because her data averaged differing preferences over the course of a cycle. At the center of the iris is a pupil, an opening that lets light pass into the eye. The pupil dilates and constricts as the ambient light dims and brightens. but the pupil also dilates in response to cognitive states such as interest or mental effort and to emotional states such as fear or attraction as we age the maximum dilation of the pupil declines when a man sees a woman with a smile and large pupils he also unconsciously sees interest as you may expect from the sex with lower parental investment he finds this attractive in one experiment a book was sold whose cover bore the face of a smiling woman On some covers her pupils were artificially enlarged men preferred to buy a book with larger pupils though they could not say why they picked up a genuine albeit fallible clue of a woman's interest the pupils of a woman will when her fertility is high dilate more to a sexually arousing image unless she is on birth control pill in her first experiment samaknazad darkened irises so that pupils were not visible and influential But in a second experiment she studied how the sizes of iris and pupil interact to influence attraction. She showed men on each trial two photos of a woman's face that were identical except that one had larger irises and pupils. The men were asked to pick the more attractive face. As expected they picked the face with larger irises and pupils. These are cues to youth and interest. Then Samaknazar put the men in a quandary. On each trial she showed them two photos of a woman's face that were identical except that one had larger irises and smaller pupils this forced a man to choose between a younger woman showing less interest and an older woman showing more different men took different strategies some chose the younger face others the face showing interest such variations of strategy are green shoots for the pruning hand of natural selection when in low fertility women prefer smaller pupils less interest in the eyes of men a few days before ovulation they switch to prefer larger pupils this early switch might have evolved to allow them time to create and evaluate a short list of interested men for short term mating some women are attracted to bad boys on the course men who are fickle frivolous opportunistic hard headed handsome confident and conceited on the course these women prefer larger pupils in the eyes of men The sclera, the white of the eye, affects attraction. No other primates have white scleras. Their scleras are dark, hiding the direction of gaze from predators and from members of their own species, for whom a stare can be a threat. The white sclera of the human eye advertises gaze direction, making it a tool for social communication. It also advertises emotion and health. The sclera is covered by the conjunctiva, a thin membrane containing tiny blood vessels. Certain emotions such as fear and sadness and certain pathologies such as allergies and conjunctivitis cause these vessels to dilate making the sclera red. This is not lost on our genes. Photos of faces in which the whites of the eyes are artificially reddened look emotional and less attractive. 
Liver disease and aging can add a yellow cast to the sclera. Whitening the sclera makes a face more attractive. The sclera in infants is thin, allowing the choroid below to give the white sclera a bluish cast. As we age, the sclera thickens and this cast disappears. So bluish scleras are correlated with youth. Because men prefer youth in women and women prefer slightly older men, I predicted that men, more than women, prefer bluer scleras in the opposite sex. Samagnazad tested this prediction. She showed a sequence of faces and had observers use a slider to adjust the hue of their scleras from bluish to yellowish until each face looked most attractive. Women adjusted male scleras to be slightly blue, but men, as predicted, adjusted female scleras to be bluer. Once again, a subtle cue to fitness is picked up by our genes. One application is clear. To make your portrait more attractive, don't just whiten your scleras. Add a hint of blue. Women should add a tad more blue than men. Our eyes, being moist, also sparkle with highlights, which enhance their attraction. Professional photographers know this and use catch lights to add highlights on the eyes. Painters know this as well. The eyes of the Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring sparkle with life. The eyes of the Mona Lisa have no sparkle, adding to her enigma. Anime cartoons exaggerate highlights to heighten the attraction of their characters. Filmmakers avoid highlights in the eyes of villains, making them lifeless and nefarious. Highlights in the eyes reflect from a film of tears produced by lacrimal glands that veil the cornea and sclera. The film grows thin and our eyes grow dry as we age and suffer disease, such as the Jogren syndrome, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid disease, and meibomian gland dysfunction. A dry eye reflects less light than one covered with an ample film, so brighter highlights signal youth and health. Does our feeling of attraction track this signal? Darren Peshek found that indeed it does. Faces with highlights are more attractive than faces with no highlights or dim highlights. But if the highlight in one eye is higher than in the other, suggesting an asymmetry between the eyes, then the face is most less attractive. If you add highlights to your portrait, take care that they are vertically aligned. Humans are not alone in their attention to highlights in eyes. The owl butterfly, for instance, has fake owl eyes painted on its wings, each eye flourishing a fake highlight. This attention to detail suggests an evolutionary arms race in which fake eyes, in order to scare avian predators, grew even more realistic as the vision of hungry birds grew ever more discerning. At the same point in this race, a mutation, perhaps affecting genes such as the ingrailed, distilless hedgehog or notch genes, daubed a highlight on an eye spot that was lifelike enough to scare off birds, and the mutation caught on. This arms race is oft repeated. Many species of butterflies and moths, in their battle to survive, flaunt eye spots with fake highlights. Fake highlights can also promote love. For females of African butterfly, Bicyclus aninana, the highlights on a male's eye spots, if crafted just right, are a turn on. If his smell is also up to par, they are irresistible. Why are fake sparkles so alluring? A male whose eye spots have the right sparkles is better at scaring up predators and staying alive. A female attracted to him is more likely to have offspring with eye spots that scare off predators. So the genes behind her attraction are more likely to spread. Fake highlights attract love because they avoid war. Genes have other strategies with eye spots. The large and flamboyant tail of the peacock, for instance, with its spray of hypnotizing eye spots, signals to the peahen that, despite this weighty handicap, he's fit enough to avoid predation and thus fit enough to warrant her affection. Genes use many schemes to push their way into the next generation, all sphere in love, war, and snatching fitness points. The eyes of animals on land sparkle with highlights because the index of refraction of light in air differs from its index in the film of tears on the eyes. For creatures in water, this difference of index disappears, and with it the sparkle of highlights in their eyes. Some fish, such as the eye spot govi, the amban damselfish, and the copper band butterfly fish, evolved eye spots as a defense against predators. But their eye spots lack highlights because eyes in water lack highlights. The fitness payoffs for fake highlights depends on the context. Some if by land, none if by sea. Your genes ply a variety of strategies to finagle their way into the next generation. It wasn't until 1863 that William Hamilton, then a graduate student in London discovered that the genes inside your body can also push the genes inside other bodies into the next generation. Not just any other bodies, but bodies that contain genes related to your own. 
You share half of your genes with your siblings and parents, a quarter with your grandkids, and an eighth with your cousins. Hamilton discovered that natural selection permits a strategy to survive if it confers a benefit of fitness to a relative that is greater than its cost of fitness to you. How much greater depends on how related you are. The benefit to your brother or sister must be at least twice the cost to you. The benefit to a grandchild at least four times the cost to you. And the benefit to a cousin at least eight times the cost to you. This broader notion of fitness is called inclusive fitness. Under quotes, to distinguish it from the notion of personal fitness, under quotes, which we have discussed until now. The two notions are not at odds. Inclusive fitness simply recognizes a broader spectrum of strategies by which genes muscle into the next generation. Inclusive fitness can explain the evolution of some altruistic behaviors which enhance the fitness of others at a cost to oneself. An example is the alarm call of the building's ground squirrel a native of the northwestern United States, which sits low on the food chain and high on the menu for eagles, weasels, bobcats, badgers, and coyotes. If a wary squirrel detects an eagle, it shrieks in alarm, even if it is exposed and vulnerable. It warns nearby squirrels and risks its own life by calling attention to itself. If nearby squirrels share genes of shrieking and alarm, this strategy lubricates the passage of these genes to the next generation, even if now and then a sentinel becomes a meal. The genes survive even if and indeed because some squirrels are sacrificed. That's a risk the genes are willing to take. There are limits, however, to the altruism of squirrels. When a predator comes by land rather than by air, a squirrel darts to safety before shrieking. A gene in you that forfeits you to save your neighbor can survive if it also resides in that neighbor. The chance of co-residence depends on your genetic relatedness. Because we cannot inspect DNA, our genes have evolved strategies that fallibly but adequately estimate relatedness. One strategy assumes that your conspecifics, members of your own species that are nearby, are more related to you than those farther away. This is true often enough to shape a useful heuristic, show more altruism towards those you more often see. Another strategy estimates relatedness from sensory cues. A female building's ground squirrel, for instance, relies heavily on scents to estimate relatedness and favors those who smell more related to her. Larry Maloney, a professor of psychology at New York University, and Maria del Martello, a professor of psychology at Padua University in Italy, found that we can estimate kinship between strangers by looking at their faces. We glean more information about kinship from the upper half of the face than from the lower. The eyes, in particular, account for one-fifth of our ability. The features of the eyes that influence our estimate of kinship are not yet known. We have seen in this chapter that features of eyes, such as the limbal ring, can make us attractive and thereby enhance our personal fitness. The eyes, as it happens, also inform us about kinship and thereby enhance inclusive fitness. The eyes may be windows to the soul but they are certainly windows to what matters most in evolution, fitness, both personal and inclusive. I focus in this chapter on the beauty of eyes, both for brevity and because we spend more time watching eyes than any other objects. Our genes, of course, estimate fitness using hundreds of other sensory cues, such as height, weight, smell, and the quality of voice. Genes shape male perceptions of female beauty. To be clear, this fact does not justify sexism, patriarchy or oppression of women. The discovery that genes influence our emotions and behavior does not justify an oppressive status quo any more than the discovery that genes influence cancer justifies cancer. To prove to the contrary, the advance of evolutionary psychology provides tools to understand and prevent oppression, just as the advance of molecular biology provides tools to understand and treat cancer. Evolutionary psychology reveals that our perception of beauty is an estimate of reproductive potential. This does not entail that we have sex only to procreate. Exaptation, in which a trait evolved for one function can co-opt a new function, is commonplace in nature. We use sex to procreate, but also to bond, play, heal, and enjoy pleasure. With these provisions, our study of beauty is just the background we need to grapple with our central question, do we perceive reality as it is? We will find a counterintuitive answer. If our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, then space-time and physical objects, like beauty, reside in the eye of the beholder. They inform us about fitness, but not about truth or objective reality. reality.